Welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. If you're struggling with any kind of substance abuse or any kind of issues like that, you're going to want to pay attention. If you have a, if you're a loved one of somebody who's dealing with that, you definitely want to pay attention. This is going to be a really impactful uh, podcast episode. Uh, my guest is going to be absolutely awesome. She's got some amazing stuff to cover. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome to the podcast, Colleen. Keith, thanks for Glad to have you here. Yeah. Glad to be here. So go ahead and just lead us off here a little bit and tell us a little bit about your military story, your background. Sure. Uh, I was in the Navy for almost 11 years, 99 to 2010. I was an Aegis fire controlman on board destroyers. Um, I served out of Seattle or Everett, I guess I should say, and Pearl Harbor. I um, spent my last four years in San Diego. That is where I really got into sport and performance psychology and took that outside of the military for my advanced degree. Awesome. What What was the spark that kind of, you know, I think a lot of people, when you start thinking about college, whether it's, you know, you turn 18 and go off to college or you serve a few years and go back, everybody kind of has some sort of inspiration for the field or direction they go. So yeah. was there something in particular that sports psychology like was calling your name oh, yeah well okay well so in order to get into the navy i thought you were going to ask that question like what inspired oh. me <laughs> <laughs> it, kind of goes, yeah, it leads into the answer to that okay next. all right well there you go uh, i mean well, everybody I'm, usually has so many different different stories about that yeah. so that could be a whole that could be a whole hour by itself sometimes it's true it's true I'll keep it brief. I grew up on my grandfather's <laughs> sea stories, period. That was it. Like I was very, very intrigued and wanted to understand what I felt like he understood about the world. He also thought women should not be on ships, but showed him. Um, anyway, anyway, I, before the military, really uh, got into mental skills training or like visualization and things like that in order to prepare myself for boot camp. And it was just something that I taught myself and learned how to do on my own. And it really, really helped, honestly. Um, and then I just, I was just intrigued by that. I kept leaning on that sort of like mental training in order to deal with, you know, normal situations that we all find ourselves in the military. So I just kept going down that line. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know that anybody's ever given me something like that or ever, you know, I, people prepare by going and doing push-ups and sit-ups and, you know, meet with their recruiters and stuff like that. But yeah. the mental aspect of it, never really. There's more say happening that. now than there was when I was, I mean, I've been out for longer than I was in at this point, which is like yeah. mind blowing. <laughs> um, but there's definitely like the um, uh, master resilience training and things like that are happening in the army more so than I think any other branch, but there's, there's some of it in there now. Well, it's about time that we come around to, to some of that stuff, but yeah, for sure. I, I, I can tell you before I joined, that mental aspect of things was, was not, not something that I don't think ever came across my radar at all. Yeah. yeah. I think I was more concerned about, you know, all the exercise or, <laughs> you know, like, the, the, or, or maybe like the fear of the unknown of like everything. Yeah. Like you just don't know how, like, how is it really going to go down? It's so uncertain. Everything yeah. about it is so uncertain. Like, yeah, I'm going to get some flack for saying this because I'm an airman. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know I am. The best things always come after somebody says something like that. Don't I'm worry. prepare myself for it. But boot camp was actually pretty easy for me. <laughs> Basically training, I guess, if you want to be technical yeah. the way the Air Force calls it. I don't care what you call it. When I went through it was six and a half weeks. I know it's like, I think it's eight and a half now. But for me, it was a breeze. Huh. I got a laundry crew. There was four of us. Two of them didn't do anything. A drill instructor <laughs> fired them. He's like, can you two, the two of you handle everybody's laundry? And we're like, oh, extra time to study. Less time yeah, on a drill funny. pad. Yes. Yes, sir. We can do that. <laughs> where did you? Where was boot camp? Uh, Lackland Air Force Base oh, okay. in San Antonio. Yeah, I was lucky enough to do not only uh, boot camp there, but being security forces. Our tech school is there too, so oh, every, okay. I got to watch everybody else go get on those buses after graduating and fly off to their next base. You know, and, and the rest of us got to sit around and do a little extra cleaning for a, I think it was like a day. And the next day, they loaded us up on a bus and just drove us about six blocks. And we're like, here you go. Here's huh. your next home. <laughs> That's what I did. You're up in Illinois, right? You know, I was yeah. in great place, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I was in, I stayed there for two tech schools. So I was there for almost a year. Yeah. Quite, yeah. quite an interesting experience to see, isn't it? From like, you see it from one perspective yeah. in, in boot camp, And then all of a sudden, like you get a little bit more 
a privilege and rights and freedom to move around a little bit, but little you bit. still got nothing, you know. But but at least you're not marching around in formation all the time, you know. Uh, off yes. duty. Okay, well, <laughs> for us, we had phases. Sorry so to say. Like, Sorry to say. <laughs> for our tech school, there was phases. Like, so first phase, you had to be in uniform, but that lasted like a, maybe a couple of weeks. And then the next phase is you could put on civilian clothes after the duty day. After the duty day. Okay. So, I mean, oh, gotcha. hang around. You still couldn't go off base. Uh, yeah, and then the yeah. third phase. Yeah. Third phase, you could go off base um, in civilian clothes. You could wear civilian clothes at, off you duty. You remember all of this. Yeah. I mean, some, it's, some, it's something like that. It's pretty close to that. Then there was like this uh, mysterious fourth phase where like <laughs> you had complete freedom. You didn't even have to like sign out. You could just like leave the base just like any act, you know, any active duty troop. But like, of course, it was like this mysterious phase that no no team ever got to. <laughs> it was like the one they hold it held over you. You just keep trying a little harder. It's Everybody behave. You'll you'll get to four. <laughs> Great tactic. I'm not sure it existed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not for not for you. <laughs> yeah, not not for us at least. Anyway, maybe someday somebody somewhere got it. If somebody, if, if if there's a listener that did, please reach out. And let me know. <laughs> let me know if it actually existed. So, um. So you study, you know, you've done a lot of studying on depression and anxiety uh, and trends and stuff like that. What, what, like, what, what are you seeing lived, about different things? Most of my study has been experience. And well, there's nothing the, like experience, right? Yeah. Oh, nothing. So, like. <laughs> what, uh, what, what kind of trends I, I saw it somewhere have happened since like 2019 with the pandemic oh, and, so, and depression and anxiety? And the numbers are like through the roof for everything. I don't even. There's so much, Keith. Let's talk about the numbers here for a second. I mean, I am not attached to any of these numbers because they're so high. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And all these stats and this and this and this, and they're so huge. Like it doesn't, let's like get ourselves away from the numbers and just go and try and find some solutions to these challenges. Right. I couldn't agree more. They're big. They're big, big numbers. And one of the biggest challenges that we've had because of the pandemic and since is our access to all of these things that we use to escape from our natural state of mind in order to feel better that make us feel worse, right? Like we can have anything delivered to our house now. I mean, we don't even have to leave, which adds to the isolation and the loneliness. You can have alcohol delivered. We have, I, I was reading the other day, 817,000 options for streaming television shows. Holy cow. Think about that for a second, because I can't even like conceptualize that. But I was curious because it's just endless and it's mind numbing and it's it's a pro like it's become a really big problem. Yeah. Like 10 years ago, you had like Netflix and maybe Hulu. Yeah. You know, and you had a few different options on each one. Now they have their own shows. And then there's all the apps and all these other companies that have their own like streaming service. I think you're probably streaming like, the same stuff, but the breakout shows from the show. Every character has now their own show. None of it is real. And all of it is just like, I call it zombie TV, like zombie TV eyes. Like you're just like zoned out passively living out. I love TV, but the point is that it's mind numbing. All of these things are. And so we're avoiding all of these uncomfortable feelings. And now we have so much access to these things that we're using to do that that it's made depression, anxiety, stress, everything worse. That's a good point. Like it makes you feel good. You know, and I mean, maybe, maybe, wrong. Second, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. it feels good to scroll through TikTok for an hour at a time. You get a lot of entertainment out of it, but you also waste a lot of time. It's, it, it hurts it just, my just, brain. Can you it really? It distracts you. Oh my gosh, it hurts. Yeah. <laughs> makes my knees hurt when I, not, I want to see people dancing. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. My algorithm has changed. I no longer see people dancing. So I don't know if it's a trend <laughs> or not, but. It did for a while, though, there. I'm like, man, I, how, do, how do people learn these dances so fast? Well, like, you make I'm, a good I'm point. So, Social so media. I could do disco, and I'm, I'm too young for that, you know? Like, I, that's a simple movement. <laughs> <laughs> Social media, you know, I mean, that, I mean, all of these things we have to be able to regulate ourselves, and it's very difficult to do. Once Absolutely. We've, once we've trained ourselves the opposite way to keep just using it. I think we all probably have a little something, too. Unfortunately, some people it's it's actual harmful substances. Yes. Some people maybe it's video games. Yes. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe yes. it's some other unhealthy thing that I can't even Alcohol's think of. Alcohol, obviously. Very Alcohol, great. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, how does we'll break down like substance abuse and mental health? So, how does somebody's mental health when it's when it's negative and it's it's 
depression, anxiety, how does that lead to substance abuse? Like what is actually happening? I mean, I know that the consumption of alcohol or drugs or whatever is numbing the pain. Yeah. Like what, what's actually happening in that cycle? Well, I can speak mostly from my own experience. My professional background is in mental toughness and performance psychology and those types of things. But what's happening like in your body, in your brain, I mean, for everybody, kind of the point yeah. is, is that it's very, very individual of what's happening. Okay. But the main point here is to become more aware of it for yourself if you're somebody that is using something more than you want to. Like if you're, if you have this thought that you're uncomfortable, you're tired, you're unhappy, like just ask yourself, what am I using maybe too much or what am I using in general and how is it making me feel? And there's lots of difference. I've, I've created this program called Hashtag Binging Sober. And when I talk about sobriety, it's exactly what you just said. It's not, it's not, I'm not talking about just alcohol. I'm talking about a lack of intoxication from any of these things you just mentioned. Like there, are, there's a world full of things that we can use and abuse. There's different amounts we can do things. Like you don't, you, you don't have to be like a, you know, you don't have to identify as an alcoholic to say, wait a minute, I'm maybe using this too much. If I have a half a glass of wine, that's very different than drinking a whole bottle. Now then there's this self-regulation and control piece that comes into it. There's, there's a whole bunch of things that come into it, but with awareness, control and balance and ownership of those things that you're doing, you can train yourself to feel better by allowing yourself these sober binges. That's what I'm calling them, like binging sober. You know, we binge watch, binge eat, binge drink. Let's binge sober. And it's a practice and a process that I've been using for prob probably, I want to say 20 years. But, you know, as a 20 something year old, I wasn't necessarily aware that I was doing it. It was later on that I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is actually something like this is actually something. Once you feel what that feels like, and I'm not talking about abstaining for, you know, from everything that you're doing. I'm talking about letting off of one thing at a time. See what happens, see how it impacts you, see how you feel. I know that there are chemical, chemical imbalances and things that need to be supported by mental health care professionals, by doctors, by all, you know, if you are that person that needs that support, please, you know, have that support. But something magical happens when you say, okay, well, three days from now, if I have this, <laughs> like this awareness that comes with it is if I have these three glasses of wine, I'm still going to feel it in three days. And I'm speaking from personal experience. So I'm not going to have it or I'll have half a glass just because I want to taste it or whatever. Um, and then to, to know also to be aware of things that you can do to counteract or like reverse the impact of whatever that is. This is what, when I talk about hashtag binging sober, it's the world's first point system for vitality. So it's being aware of those things that you're using to escape controlling because what we don't, what I've noticed from people that I've worked with from just being alive is that people think that, or they're not really paying attention to what sorts of things they can control and what sorts of things they cannot control. And if we focus on the things that we can control, i.e. the things that we're using to escape to try to feel better, but they're normally making us feel worse. If we can control those things and find balance in them, like let's say I do have two glasses of wine. Well, I can also drink a whole ton of water. I can go for a walk. I can, I can get to bed at a normal time and get a full night's sleep. I can have some protein before bed. I know that those are things that I can do to reverse the impact. So it's really gaining power over these things that we've kind of become like the puppet to the, to the world of escape instead of the opposite. It's up to us to own and control. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and finding pop, you kind of alluded to it, like finding positive replacements mm -hmm. for things, but the key is definitely awareness. Or I mean, I mean you, positive replacements. Yes. But also saying, okay, I do want to have this, but I can also do this and, and reverse it. And it's knowing that for yourself, because your question was like, how does, how do people like, 
why do you become addicted and yeah. you know, those kinds of things. Well, it is very, very individual. How something impacts you could be totally different how it impacts me. And if so, if we're trying to fit ourselves into a little box and trying to understand things in that way, a lot of times it's not going to work. It's a good point. Yeah, it's things are definitely individual. And I think it's worth pointing out that not everybody, everybody has a different relationship with things too. Yeah. Like yeah. I hear people talk about their substance abuse, you know, being an alcoholic or being a drug addict. I would never consider myself having been an alcoholic, but after my first deployment, I was drinking a lot. Yeah. Um, anybody who served with me when I was in Japan would know I would drink to the point of blacking out probably four nights a week. Yeah. And it, you know, and it, it, took, like, it took a while it was to get through that. And it wasn't until I came to the States. It was really part of the culture. And so, you know, as a 20 something, I really didn't see it as a problem because it was just what everybody around me was doing. And that's not good. And that's kind of oh. like, that's not good at all. It's definitely part of the culture. You got, you nailed yeah. that one on the head. Yeah. yeah. Cause there is this like, Hey, we, we work hard. We, we put in our, our, our duty week. Now it's a, we got day, two days off, whatever, like, or sometimes in the middle of the week, you know, whatever, but just go out and drink and party. Yeah. And I knew people that could control it. They could go out and have two or three drinks and be fine. Yeah. Me, it was, I mean, I was in such a mental state where I would just drink until I'd black out. Yeah. I mean, it was bad. I did. I did some things that I don't remember at all that mm -hmm. other people have told me those stories. And it's like, oh man, not my finest moments, you know, but here, gosh, I've been out what 11 years now. That's what I was going to ask. So you didn't have digital cam, like digital cameras. No, thanks. We're just coming goodness. up. I know. Oh my gosh. Oh boy. No, I mean, we had cell phone, like I had a cell phone and stuff in Japan and it had a camera on it, but like, I think I probably had like 10 phone numbers in it, right? Flight yeah. chief, supervisor, maybe a couple exactly. other guys on, on my shift, whatever. But we just, I, I don't even know if I carried it around all the time. But, you know, really like it came, come me coming back to the States and coming to Scott Air Force Base and I had an apartment. I got really, really drunk one night. Um, I can still remember the game. It was Texas versus Texas Tech. Texas Tech was having a great season. They had Michael Crabtree and Graham Harrell. They were supposed to win. Crazy catch at the end. I, I, I'm sitting there like drinking, you know, whatever. And, uh, and I ran out of vodka and I had this dumb idea. The grocery store was uh, like three blocks away. I drove there. I remember driving there knowing that I was yeah. not staying in the lanes and I got there. I went in, bought more, came back, got in my car, drove back. So I, I have no idea how I didn't hit something. I found myself, my door was like cracked open an inch. The vodka and the Coke was sitting next to the front door and I was passed out on the couch. I woke up the mor next morning. Ooh. Like, and that, that's when I realized, like, I remembered enough of that night and was kind you know, aware enough when I was driving it. I was like, this is a problem. Yeah. I'm in the States. When I was in Japan, I walked to the bar. Yeah. That was one thing. Walked to the bar. You got some, some buddies to go with you, whatever. I was like, I'm going to screw everything up. Yeah. Everything in my life is going to come crashing down if I do this one more time. Yeah. Until still to this day, people probably, I don't know if people, most people know that if I go out socially, I will drink, but I'll have no more. If there's dinner or something, I might have four or five, but I typically won't. I, I typically won't have, I'm talking like a long evening. Okay. You know what I mean? Like okay. it could be like an event from like five o'clock till like 11, you know, but I will drink usually no more than three drinks in a social setting. Yeah. You know, and it just depends. Like if I eat anything, like what am I going to drink? You know, there's sometimes where I'm like, look, I haven't eaten anything all day. I know. Yeah. I, I can't well, that's the kind of, that's one the kind of I'm talking about. If you know that you're, you obviously gained control over that and knew that you had to eat something. Yeah. It took that, that, that moment yeah. that could have ended in disaster Gosh, for horrible. me to wake up and be like, this is a problem. Yeah. Was not going down the right path. So you know, I think that there just needs to be massive like mindset shift on this proactive preventative direction that as an entire society, we're really not really not living that way right now yeah well you know it, and society has given us a lot of a lot of crazy stuff look at the last two years so almost three years you know yeah it's 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 hard to to paint that picture but i don't think in the 30 something plus years before that that i was alive that this many crazy things happened in a short oh, period of time <laughs> you know? i mean the world has just been crazy over the last few yeah. years yeah. You know, so it doesn't surprise me that those numbers of suicides and substance abuse exactly. and, and, and diagnosed mental health issues has gone up. 
Not, not a surprise at all. So um, I, I know you kind of mentioned, you know, your struggle. Um, what, what kind of things did you struggle with personally, if, if you don't mind sharing? Oh, sure. Um, well, I, depression in my adolescence, my parents were divorced. My grandfather, the man who like inspired my entire life passed away unexpectedly. And back then, you know, it was different than at least we're talking about it now. Back then, no one talked about depression. Nobody talked about these things. I felt my mother took me to a counselor. I thought that there was something horribly wrong with me. Like it didn't fix anything because that was the idea and the language we used around, you know, therapy at that point. And so I didn't get the support that I needed. I didn't understand what was happening. My parents didn't understand what was happening. So it was just something that I dealt with on my own. And, um, alcohol abuse was like my main, like just avoiding the feelings, like just avoid, avoid, avoid those feelings. Um, so I went into the Navy at 21. That's when I finally felt like strong enough to go mentally. I told you I was using the yeah. mental skills training before I even knew what the heck I was doing. Um, and, uh, so that was then supported by this culture you know, of partying and drinking that in of itself, like was a really big start to what has become hashtag binging sober because during that time, and I want to put a trigger warning out for anybody who's experienced um, trauma around sexual assault, because I was raped by two boys in the Navy. I took responsibility for it because I had had so much to drink. I was blacked out. I didn't have awareness or control or any of those things that I hold so dearly and all are the foundations of this program that I'm sharing. And I didn't report it, just left and buried it. I didn't even think about it for another 15 years. I just pushed it so, so far down into my being. Wow. You had to push that really far down. Well, you know what happens with trauma that stuff comes out anyway. Oh, it's going to come like, up eventually. It's going to come out. So then I was drinking more. I was a horrible person. I was just mean. I was heartless. I was, I, I didn't see this at the time. I was just trying to survive. You know, you're just trying yeah. to survive holding this toxic, toxic pain. That's what trauma is. I heard somebody the other day as an army uh, active duty uh, guard guy said, you have to feel to heal. And I was like, yes, that's exactly, exactly it. You've got to be able to feel it, to heal it. When you're repressing it, it's going to come out anyway. I was destroying relationships. I was just self-destructive. And so that was happening, but I still had another nine years in. During that time, I had a lot of sea time. And what I noticed is that when I was out to sea, I didn't have access to a lot of those things that I was using to make myself feel better. Interesting. That's yeah, where, access would be. That's where binging sober was born because I would not have those things for a few days here, a few days there. Like, and I started to notice that I would feel better, like better than I'd ever felt because I started drinking when I was like 15. Yeah, so, you're like waking up on the right side of the bed, yeah, hang over like, symptoms, no, nothing like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that a lot of vets can relate to that because, I mean, you you know, I mean, on deployment on ships, like people would get ripped, like just like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing else but to do to just work yeah. out, work on yourself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because all of those things that typically like distract you aren't, they're not there. That's a really good point. I so never, I never really thought about things like that. Well, I noticed that I kept doing this anyway, like unknowingly after the military, I kept doing this where I'd be like, you know what? I'm just going to take a few days break from this kind of stuff because I would remember how good I felt like not doing this. And it came down to, you know, binge watching scary TV that screws up my sleep. I want, we need to talk about sleep with vets is a huge problem. I mean, sleep with everybody is a huge problem. But with that, I heard a stat that 45% of the suicide rate, those 45% of those who die by suicide have a diagnosed sleep disorder. And I was like, that's a really big number, but that's really how important sleep is. And I noticed that for myself, I've struggled with suicidal thoughts. And if I don't get enough sleep, that's the trigger that sends me 
like sends me because then I want coffee, then I want caffeine, then I'm screwing up the next night of sleep. Then, <laughs> then I drink because I can't come down and I can't fall asleep. So drinking will help, right? No, drinking does not help sleep. So you're doing, you're eating horribly because you're exhausted. You're, you know, like it, the list goes oh, yeah. on, and on and on and on. And that's what hashtag binging sober is about is putting awareness around all of those things that we call the downward spiral, but we never really look at what that means. And that's just like this, this, I'm just passively letting all of these things that I could maybe gain some control over. Like if you own them, you can say, wait a minute, what's happened? Like whenever I have, because I still currently, I, you know, you manage depression. Those things don't go away. Like you manage them. They get a lot better. You gain power over them and you know how to manage it. But I still have, like, I'll still struggle with suicidal thoughts, but now it's like this huge red flag. It's like, Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> like yeah, what's you're happening? on the wrong path. Like cor <laughs> course correct this. What, what are you doing right now? Like, did you drink? Like I go through this list. Did you drink? Did you sleep? Well, did you, you know, like, I have like this, you know, list that I <laughs> refer to because I mean, it sounds trivial and silly and I'm not trying to make light of it, but I think it's also really important that we stop having the same conversations around it. And when we say this, you know, they were stuck in a downward spiral. You're taking the responsibility off of that person that's in the spiral. And so we have to own our own stuff. Yeah. You know, one thing I always said is, um, you know, coming to terms with things is I've kind of re you know, related it to a band aid. You know, I had blinders on that I had PTSD or any issues from mm. my time in service until about 2020. Yeah. Yeah, go figure, right? During the pandemic. During the pandemic. But just like a series of events, like I just I didn't feel myself. You know, all these things, yeah. a couple of different things happened. And then I had a, a good friend of mine. He's been on my show. You know, um, he lost his wife tragically to COVID. And, and I reached out to him and I was connected with him. You know. And, we talk every now and then, either through messenger or whatever. And, and he's like, dude, you know, you were deployed to the same place I was. You never got any help. You never went to a counselor. And I was like, yeah, no, never. He goes, call me an idiot. He's like 13 years, dude, you're an idiot. He goes, go to a counselor, go start getting help dealing with different things that you deal with. But I always looked at it. Like I don't punch holes in the wall. I don't, you know, I don't abuse my kids or my wife or throw them down. The, you know, the things like the movie show. Yeah. Like, yeah, I can see that. Like, that's yeah. that's not me. Like, yeah, like I spend a lot of time in my office and I self isolate, and uh, but I don't drink. I don't have a drug problem. Yeah. I don't do these other things. But yeah, I'm a little antisocial sometimes around people. Yeah, maybe I might snap at my kids if they interrupt me when I'm working on something, or might you know things here and there. Never thought about it as PTSD, but when I did and started going down that path and discovering things, it was like a, a band aid being ripped off. Yeah, it hurt bad. Mm -hmm. And it was like all these emotions, all these thoughts, all these memories kind of oh, come, yeah, come geez, rushing back. I hear you. I hear you. And it's like, you just got to process through it. It's just, you gotta feel it's the heal. Like, can you believe that an army guy just told me that? Sorry, <laughs> <national> <laughs> <army> guy. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah, you have to, you just have to, you just have to wait through the shit. Yeah. And, and just keep working at it. I mean, that's a, that's a great point. And I know that I'm, you know, going on and on. It's really easy from the other side of that decision taking the band-aid off to be like yes take the band-aid off dude i promise like it feels really good just take the band-aid off you know and but if you can like if i put myself back there before i uncover like i started having horrible flashbacks just horrible i would wake up in night terrors i would like like everything just came rushing back my i leaned on i, I i'm a huge advocate for mental health um i have a I think a good point here is that, you know, if you are preventative about mental health, that when you're in a crisis, that person is already, you're already on their books. You know what I mean? So even if you see somebody once a month or once every couple of months, but you feel fine at the time, there may be a time when you don't feel fine. And that person, now you can connect with that person because I know access is a really big problem still. And so if you're more preventative about it, then that person is there when you're in crisis. But when I started, like I was losing sleep. I, Oh, so my counselor told me that is because I was finally feeling safe, like in my life outside of like a lot of times with trauma, we will repress it until we're feeling safe enough to process mm. it for whatever reason. And for me, that was, 
getting out of the military. Now, after the military, I was still, I was binging sober, but I was also during my non-sober binges, like, woo, like traveling and drinking and blah, blah, blah. It took meeting my husband, my now husband, and me actually wanting to like have a good relationship because I hadn't, <laughs> I had never had a good relationship. I would constantly self-sabotage and I wasn't able to get close to anybody. I mean, you name it when the band-aid that you talk about, like all of these things, you're like, oh my gosh, like it was affecting everything and you didn't even know, right? Like it's just like affecting all of these things. So I had the decision to either lose this relationship that I didn't want to lose or work on myself hard. And so that, that is where I, all this stuff started coming up and I realized that it happened. But the moment that I said it, like I said the words to my therapist, it was like a million pounds came off of me. I don't know if you've had that experience, but it's like when you realize this is what it is, it's that Band-Aid coming off felt like just a relief. Yeah, I don't know if I've had that experience, but I will say like with the therapists that I've gone to, just, you know, talking through like, okay, well, you know, what angers you, what causes this? I think I mentioned on the podcast before, like, during that time, you know, my kids were home. It was, it was 2020, right? So they're doing school. They're in the room right behind me. And I would be like, look, I'm getting so mad. I'm trying to focus on an email or whatever. And all of a sudden I get this tap on the shoulder, you know, and, and it's like, what? So like, what do you want? You know? And it'd be like, uh, dad, I just want to tell you, I love you. Aww. You know, or, or like, dad, I don't understand this math question, whatever the case was, you know, and I was like, it, it annoys me. She's like, hmm, do you have a lock on your door? I was like, oh. Yeah, but I got to be there for the kids, you know. She's like, do you have a whiteboard? Yes, I do. She goes, can you hang a whiteboard outside your office somewhere? <laughs> Ironically, I had two of them in the storage room. It. I was like, yeah. yes, I can. So got some, you know, dry erase markers, hung the whiteboard. She goes, all right, now tell your kids you're going to come out of your office every hour or about every hour. If they have any messages or need help with homework, to write it on the whiteboard in whatever their color is. Brilliant. And so then I was able to do that, shut my door, lock it, focus on my stuff. They could focus on theirs and I would come out every now and then. And you yeah. know what was weird? They normally didn't have that many serious questions. Most of the time it was my youngest writing, dad, I love you on the board. <laughs> or some pissing hearts on there. Some things like that. You know, and it was like, wow. I mean, that's just, he just wanted, he was just happy to be home. Yeah. Got distracted. He wanted to come and see what I was doing. And you're having a different experience. And I'm having a totally different experience with it. So like. For me, it was really helpful, just like getting different tools and changing yes. like my day to day. Like, OK, fix that. Yeah. You know, you my kids were home. Can't be your own therapist. Yeah. Your friends can't be your therapist. Look, if you're going to turn into friends. Yes, please. Peer support. Yes, please. I mean, I'm not saying that is a no, but you're like echoing. You, there's this like term I heard idiot compassion where like you're supporting your friends so much with so much bias that it's not helping. Like you, you've got to have somebody that is outside of your world that can see things from that different perspective, you know? Yes. And there, there's a lot of power of just being able to just talk through things yeah, with people. 100%, you know, yeah. I've had two counselors at the VA. I'm waiting on another one to come in. You know, it is what it is. But, you know, another thing the VA offers, if people aren't aware of this, is whole health. Yeah. Now, that was pitched to me by my, I think it was my primary care physician asked me. And I said, well, what is it? She's like, well, it's whole health. So they're not counselors, but they can walk you through that, help you with resources, you know, food, exercise plans, like, it's, you know, figure out what you want to do in life, whatever. Right. And I was like, okay, I got to thinking, I was like, as a podcaster on veterans issues, maybe it'd be a good idea for me to get in the system and see what it's all about. So I know what I found was, uh, I absolutely love the lady I got partnered up with. She used to be in, in a counselor. She isn't anymore. But her and I can sit there and talk for, for the whole hour on anything and everything. There's like that. this workbook you have to like work through. I've met her like six times. We're still, oh still not even past God. the second page. And to me, it's just like just somebody to talk to about my problems yeah. and issues. And she can point different directions, resources, information. Absolutely wonderful. Love talking to her. Love that. And it's, it's VA resource. It's free. I do it through telehealth. It's nice. easy to schedule. <laughs> Oh my gosh, telehealth is so great. And I didn't think that I would, like during the pandemic, I had to start seeing my therapist virtually and I had teenagers at home. And so I couldn't like talk about them. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't talk oh, about sure them. sure you could. Well, so, well, what happened was I started <laughs> typing. I started typing instead of talking 
And I was able to be more honest when I was typing. It was really interesting. So if anyone out there is thinking like, I don't want to do virtual therapy, please give it a try. It's fantastic. And then I was like, wait a minute. Hey, let's turn off the camera and see what happens. Well, I guess I've discovered that I don't like to hear myself complain a lot, but if I'm typing, I don't feel like I'm complaining. So I was able to like work through a whole bunch of stuff that I don't think I would have worked through otherwise. It was really interesting. Just goes to show there's multiple ways to do it, right? Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of counselors too. And I think everybody should go, go to a counselor every that now and then the there's world. resources. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, <laughs> unfortunately there's not enough counselors out there. Yeah. There's a huge lack in the field, but yes, I did want to ask about your counsel. You mentioned that you went to a counselor as a kid and mm -hmm. then you had this forethought, if you will, to think about the mental aspect of going to boot camp. Yeah. Do you think was there was there any tie-in? Like was there any inspiration from that of thinking about mindset and stuff having gone to a counselor at a young age? I I mean that's an interesting point. I I could I could, you know, it was an emotional thing that I really wanted to feel feel good. That's a really great question. Thank you for answering asking me that because I guess I haven't really like thought this through enough to articulate it, but I really did like talking to the counselor. What happened was I told the counselor that I had thoughts of suicide. I was, you know, 14, 15 or something. Well, of course the counselor had to tell my mom, you know, my mom didn't understand that stuff. Like she lost, like I upset my mom. My mom was like crying and I love my mom. You know, I was like, Oh my gosh, I hurt my mom. I'm never talking about that again. <laughs> like I'm never talking about it again. That's why it's so important that we all talk about it. You know? I love thank yeah. you, so much for, you talk about it a lot. And I really, really appreciate that because it's so important for us to like make it normal to talk about it. But it was really, I think that there was maybe an underlying unconscious subconscious like connection that I made that um, I, and I also was, was reading books. I started reading books around that time about like how food affects your brain and how it affects your mindset and how blah, blah, blah. So it was interesting. Like I had interest in that, that sort of, positive psychology before it was even called positive psychology. I also okay. discovered long distance running, which I would call motion therapy. I remember saying that term, like when I was really, really young. And so I don't know, I, there could have been a connection made that I just hadn't really yeah. thought about. I will think about it though. Yeah. Well, motion you know. therapy is a good one. You know. you know, I know a lot of people, you know, they say getting active and going to do something can kind of burn off that stress and alter your, yeah. your mindset. Mm -hmm. Of course, on the flip side of that, some people can get a little too addicted to yep. the gym and running and working out. Yep. Uh, That's a even, really, really maybe great. Even chemicals and stuff to, yeah. to work out with. Like that too. Or I mean, again, back to sleep. If I, I know that if I work out too late in the day, like working out healthy and great. If I work out too late in the day, it screws up my sleep. That can lead me down the wrong way. I mean, there's yeah. so much. It's a very delicate balance, this life thing, you know, <laughs> that, living thing. That that there is, that there is. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. Like, I, I wouldn't work out later in the afternoon. If I'm going to work out, which I am not a um, physical specimen or an example of, uh, of working out, even though you I are, should, my wife tells me all that. I should. <laughs> but, but if I was to work out, I would work out in the morning. Like yeah. I would want that to just get my day going. Maybe some of that might just go back to my time of service of like, yeah, wake up and you do PT first thing in the morning. Duh. Yeah. That's the way it goes. Like, why would you do it before going to bed? Like, you know, you, well, I don't but, want to do it at four 30 anymore. But... <laughs> definitely. No, definitely not. It takes a lot to get me up before five o'clock in the morning. That's for sure. <laughs> It's going to have to be some sort of an emergency or something like that. <laughs> so um, I wanted to break down your your five points. Can, can you break those down for us, the five points of binging sober and, and some of those five points in your system and, and what those mean? The five points. I think you, you, got, probably uh, have you probably have bullets. No, I, I do not have bullets in my notes. But uh, the different aspects of, of binging sober. Well, so they're the main tool. And now the launch, I should tell you, is January 2023. I am starting focus groups, though, in December. And I am going to have a military veteran or family member specific focus group in December as well. So I think everybody has my website. Anyway, go. Okay. Oh, go yep. um, Good reminder. Well, <laughs> I'll throw that up there for the viewers. The listeners, it'll be in the show notes. 
<laughs> Everyone can go there if you're interested in getting updates on the launch of hashtag bingings over and or to sign up for um, one of the focus groups. I will have that up within a week, hopefully. And it's currently, am I allowed to say the day? Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I don't know how this it's the day after it, election day. It's the, it the 9th of November. So, yes. Um, so without giving away too much, you know, pre-launch information, the main tool that I have is called the scale of vitality. That's my working title. And what that is, is a way to, again, tailor your, your, um, your methods that you use for escape. You're going to spend some time gaining some more awareness around those things and assign points. It's a, it's a detailed process that I'll lead you through via videos and et cetera. Um, so you're really going to pay attention to those things and learn, learn how they impact you today, tomorrow, three days from now, next week to control them, to start controlling them, to pull some things out. Like we were talking about earlier. So we hit upon a lot of these points already, like just stop some of those things that may or may not be impacting your energy. It is, all about vitality, our energy for life. So if I say, like, just for an example, I love horror TV, love it. Like I am an addict for horror television and horror movies, but it impacts my sleep. So if I watch something horror, I know that I need to read something positive before bed, meditate before bed. So I will lose points for watching the horror TV and then gain points. The idea is to balance or be at zero. Okay. Just to give you some insight of things that I've discovered over the past probably three to five. So I've been practicing this to some degree for about 20 years, but then for the past few years, I've really been paying attention to it because I was like, oh my gosh, I think I'm onto something here. Like this really, this is pretty bit like for me, it's been really impactful to help with depression, PTS, my alcohol abuse, like all of that. So it, some someday I may find myself at a negative one or a negative two on the, my my personal scale of vitality, but I might feel great. I might feel great at a negative two. What I'm trying to say is a lot of times, and one of the things that this program will really illuminate for people is we tend to like passively live from social ideas of what something is. So let's say this idea of happiness, like. If I'm not looking at what happiness means for me, which might be a negative two on some days, then maybe I feel bad. That leads to me feeling depressed a lot of times if I think that I have to be running around with a smile on my face because that's not real, people. It's not. I know that that's what we're seeing, <laughs> but it's not real. So a lot of this is really redefining what our own ideas of these very, very impactful constructs mean to us. And then, and then just, you know, having, having control and balance of your energy. That's awesome. I love that you hit on something there. Cause I've thought about that, like not only happiness, but success and yes. other things like yeah. society There's a whole, tells us. Yep. There's a whole what, list of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like society tells you that you need like the house with the white picket fence and three car garage and such and such vehicles and a dog and like all of these things, like you have to have that and a job that makes X amount, whatever yeah. to be successful in life. Yeah. No, you don't No, it's like, really what don't. is your view of yeah. success? Yeah. You know, cause we all have different strengths. We have weaknesses. We have different environmental constraints that, that happen, you know, economic constraints, whatever, but it's, it's different for everybody. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. So reflection is definitely definitely a skill people are going to need to sharpen up a little bit for that program. Well, no, I mean it'll it'll help sharpen it. It's oh, really, that's a good point. really okay, yeah. It's a pretty simple process. Yeah. It's just a matter of doing it. Sharpen it. That's that's a good point. Yeah. You yeah. Can sharpen it during. Like that's gonna, the whole point is to sharpen it. Yeah. Good point. You're going to need it. You're going to need it to to yeah. reflect for sure. So um Let's see how does uh how could substance abuse tie into other negative habits you know is there you know what yeah i mean how does it tie into other things what are, what are you seeing out there for people well we hit on this 
already the downward spiral. I really, I really want to talk about the downward spiral because I think it's important for people to understand exactly what you're saying. Like, how does that lead to other things? Well, just for me, I, I tend to abuse caffeine. Well, if I do, and I'm like really, you know, hammering this in, but it messes up my sleep. Dude, sleep is very, very important to all aspects of life. And so if that happens the next day, I'll be moody and tired and unproductive and get stressed out. My anxiety goes up. I maybe want to have a drink because my anxiety is going up. If you're not paying attention to this, then you have a drink. Maybe you have another drink. Maybe you have another drink. Then you're screwing up tomorrow night's night of sleep. Then the next day, now you're really stressed out. Now your anxiety is through the roof again. You know, like you're, it's just, that's the downward spiral. And it, to me, like, it's always this term that I've heard, but we never talk about what that means. And I, that's, that's what it means. And what I really want to talk about is the upward spiral. That's what hashtag binging sober is about understanding that there is a way up and out of the hole that you've dug yourself into. And there's also a way of pre preventing yourself from getting there to begin with. Awesome. Let's see if I got one more question here for you. See if I can yeah. kind of re, re, re change this. Cause you've hit a lot of these things that I was going to already <laughs> ask know, about so on the fly here. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> changing this. So what can, is there any action steps or advice you have for somebody who's listening to this or watching it? And they're like, yeah, you know, that's me. I've got an addiction to pornography or yeah. gambling or alcohol, drugs, whatever, whatever the case may be. And they're like, look, I need to redefine my sobriety. Like I need to, I need to stop this. Is there any kind of thing that they could do like right now to put themselves in the mindset to do that? Well, right now, just that understanding, like if that, like, if that, like sirens going off that maybe you need to do something, then absolutely join me in January. But oh, right, that, now, yeah. <laughs> right now, like congratulate yourself because that moment of awareness is really, really important. What I love about hashtag binging sober is that you can be involved in a community or you can do it on your own. Either way, you don't have to identify yourself with this label. Now there is, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you said, like I go to like a gambler, gamblers anonymous meeting. Like you don't have to like identify 100% with that label in order to make steps for improvement because that's not what this is about. So my like immediate action item would just be like, give yourself a break and some grace and really reflect on how it's impacting your life. Take a few moments, journal about it. Just do a voice recording in your phone. Put some notes somewhere to get it out, you know, out of you and make it like a tangible thing of how this is impacting you and that you want to take steps to make it better. And then over time, like what's important is if say you, you know, don't drink tonight, if you just want to give yourself one night off and drink some water instead, just one night, you know, how do you feel in the morning? Like really pay attention to the impact, like really pay attention because what happens is, and this is what I've noticed over time and why it's so important. Now I crave the sober, the sober binges more than the alcohol. Like now I crave being clear headed and having this, like this, this place where we all have it. It's just, it's like natural zest and energy for life. We all have it. That's what vitality is, but we're just constantly trying to because we don't know that it's there. So I would just ease into that kind of practice. If you feel so inclined, please get, you know, professional help. I think that's fantastic. Or peer support, like you said, like call a friend, tell somebody. The power of words or the power of saying that you're going through this is so enormously healing. And that's something that you will never know unless you say it or do it or become aware of it. I like that. Have you, have you by chance, uh, do you know, or have you, I don't, I don't know if you've been on his podcast, but Richard Kaufman. Mm -mm. So he's a good friend I heard, of mine. Oh, I heard your, yeah, I heard yeah. your podcast with him. So yeah, uh, he's, he's been on twice and he has, you know, part of his slogan is a t-shirt that says today I decide. Oh, I love that. You know, that kind of made me think about that for a second of like, yeah. 
yeah, if you're if you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, I got a problem and I need to you yeah. know take the steps to work on it. To like today's the day to say Every day is today I decide street. I'm gonna change. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? I mean life yeah. is it's pretty, but that's like you can't have good stuff. But you can't always decide to change in the moment. Absolutely. Well, nothing happens without deciding something, right? We're faced yeah. with choices all day, every day. Yeah. So, you know, it takes that choice to, to do something different. So Exactly. 51% yeah. so, of you. I remember somebody, I think it was my older sister said, and she got it from somewhere else, but in order to make a decision, fifty, you have to want something 51%. That's it, right? Well, that's a good point. <laughs> you just have to like, that's what, <laughs> that's what like pushes you over to the actual action is 51 percent of a desire that's a darn that, that good seems, point that seems attainable i think yeah yeah that's very sim simply put but but yeah. yeah it's true so you know for those that that have decided or want to do something um we have you know got it in the show notes there it was scrolling there for a minute so people can reach out and and get into your hashtag binging sober you know, or, or if they don't want to do it and they just want to try whatever on your own or with the council, whatever, you know, there's two veterans here talking to you yeah. and we'll both say the same thing. Like, just do something. Yeah. Like just do something because at the end of the day, we we're all battle buddies and we want our battle buddies here. That's the worst thing. Absolutely. And, and if you don't get this under control, we know that the alternatives is suicide, overdose or homelessness. Let's hope not. Or, or, or one of the other. I mean, that's that's the three problems that affect our our community right now. And everybody puts a lot of talk into suicide, and, and rightfully so, because that's losing somebody permanently. But, you know, substance abuse and homelessness feed heavily into that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's at that yeah. bottom of the downward spiral. Don't reach bottom. Don't reach bottom. If somebody's mm -hmm. offering a hand or a way up or a path, right. take it. So, well, Colleen, I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us uh, and, and giving people some inspiration and a path that they can take. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Keith. Yep. No problem. All right. There you go, folks. Remember, you can check out my website for information and resources on various topics. And as I always say, if there's something that's not on there and you think it should, please reach out and let me know. Love to add it as long as it's providing value to the, to the community. And remember, if you're struggling right now, the suicide Hotline number is 988-PRESS-1, or you can text 838-255.